Morgan. Woo! <laughs> Welcome to the Phillips Wearables and Chronic Care Challenge Pitch Off. I'm Jennifer Joe. And I'm Jim Ryan. We're the co-founders of Medstro and MedTech Boston, the organizers of the challenge, and we'll be your MCs for the evening. We're so excited that Phillips is invested in the medical innovation community and is the sponsor of the challenge that has culminated in this lovely event this evening. So you're about to uh, see five finalist teams uh, pitch off in a Shark Tank style competition. Um, they're competing for uh, three cash prizes. The first place team will take home uh, $10,000. Uh, second place team gets $5,000 and the third team gets $2,500. Um, four of our teams have actually flown in from outside of Boston, as far away from the West Coast, and we have one team that's uh, from right here in Boston. But how did we come up with these five finalist team? We all know that innovation today doesn't happen in a bubble. It's an open dialogue and a collaborative process. For that reason, Phillips launched their wearables and chronic care challenge this July, because innovation doesn't take summer vacation. For the past three months, clinicians, engineers, patients, and entrepreneurs from all over the country have submitted their ideas for using wearables to improve chronic care. 13 expert judges have weighed in and guided the submitters. We had over 1,100 of you who voted from 45 states and 45 countries from around the world. Our panel of expert judges and the overall community provided more than 130 comments and feedbacks to the participants. Finally, the entire challenge garnered over 1,100 followers and 64,700 page views. For all of you who didn't have a chance to vote during the online challenge, or even those who did, we're giving you one more chance to vote here tonight for our crowd favorite award. Um, just go to this URL and vote for your favorite out of the five finalists who will present tonight. They are here, they can wave, they want your votes. Voting ends at midnight, and we will announce the winners on our website tomorrow. Thank you to you, the online judges, and the Phillips community to supporting the innovation community and choosing these five finalists. Big round of applause for them. Uh, so as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we had a panel of online judges that uh, helped decide these five finalists in addition to the, the crowd voting. Some of those judges are here in the audience tonight and we'd just like to recognize them and ask them to stand up. Um, first we have Dr. Sean Gandhi from uh, MGH, internal medicine resident and also a venture fellow at Excel Venture Management. Sean? Oh, is he not in the room yet? I think he's next to the bar. Oh, he's out at the bar. Okay. Um, <laughs> Dr. Yiding Yu, founder of Tuyage and also a practicing internist at uh, Atrius Health. Sorry, Atrius Health. Yiding? <sighs> okay. <laughs> um, and from Philips, uh, the clinical lead of the Philips Connected Sensing Venture, Nicole Heinen. Hey! <laughs> and finally, um, Carlos Rodarte, who's the founder and managing director of Volar Health. Hey, that's at the back. <laughs> we also need to say a thank you to our fabulous publicity sponsors. It is having great relationships to support this community that will drive innovative solutions for patient care. Thank you to the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, the Brigham and Women's Innovation Hub, Partners Connected Health, the American College of Cardiology, and Idea Labs. Finally, this amazing event took a lot of work and dedication from the MedTech Boston team, working very closely with the Phillips team. They've been meeting weekly for the last three months to prepare for this event. So I want to say a special thank you to Abby Ballou, Abby? <laughs> our managing editor, Abby, <laughs> our four interns who checked you in, Chris Ma, Julia Karen, Karishma Desai, and Sam Anthony. Okay, they're still outside checking people in. Yay! <laughs> and a very, very, very special thank you to Katie Consalvo. Katie. <laughs> Katie is the Senior Manager of Global Marketing Communications at Phillips. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for being here.
So to get us started this evening, we have a few opening remarks. Um, first, we're going to hear from uh, Jadev Kinikar, the head of strategic marketing and business development at Philips Connected Sensing Venture. And then after that, uh, he'll be introducing uh, Ravi Kuparaj, who's the business leader for Philips Connected Sensing Venture. Thank you, Jadev. Thank you, uh, Jim and uh, Jan, and uh, welcome to you all to the first uh, Philips Wearables and Chronic Care Challenge. It's been a truly exciting past three months with uh, overwhelming online response where we received uh, very, very creative ideas and uh, very engaged uh, community participation through voting process and discussion and comments. And it's truly uh, hard for me to believe that it was just back in July that uh, I'd sat down with the Metro team and Katie. And uh, uh, here we are today uh, with enthusiastic support from uh, our leadership, uh, uh, Ravi, Stacy, and Carla. We are just a few minutes away from uh, our finalists uh, pitching their ideas today. However, the event today is not just a culmination for us. It is a beginning of a journey, journey to spur innovation, uh, growth, in the heart of the healthcare revolution taking place here. And when you think about any revolution, uh, you need teamwork, you need collaboration, and uh, we would not have been able to actually do this without uh, our uh, publicity partners, so thank you to uh, them again. Uh, you know, there's an old saying that it uh, takes a village to raise a child, and I would like to kind of uh, adapt it today and say it takes an uh, ecosystem to raise an entrepreneur, right? And uh, we are very much committed to uh, cultivating the ecosystem uh, here in Boston uh, as a part of our efforts. Uh, I feel that today we are standing at a uh, confluence of uh, uh, very, very powerful forces that are shaping our industry. Think about uh, value-based healthcare, think about shift from uh, acute to chronic, consumerization of healthcare, and an almighty force of technology that is shaping our lives. And the big questions that we have today are, how do you solve these complex, multidisciplinary challenges? And how do you break down the silos? How do you challenge the status quo? And to do that, you really need to be innovative, nimble, and adapt with the seismic forces and shifts. It was exactly 125 years back that Philips began its journey as a startup a very nimble startup, and we still continue to embody that spirit and mindset uh, with Philips Connected Sensing and the rest of our businesses today. Uh, as, you, as you think about uh, our, our vision, our mission, it is truly to turn patients back into people. And we aspire to do that by leveraging devices, data, and people, caregivers, patients, and physicians. And as, you, as I reflect back on my IoT days and experience across other industries, it's very clear to me that healthcare has a lot to learn and borrow from other verticals. Yet, it is healthcare that has the most untapped potential to truly transform the lives of humanity here. And we need to do that not only through technology, but through better care delivery models, human-centered design, and, and a truly patient-centric uh, behavior, modification, compliance, adherence, initiatives to really bring it all of this together. Uh, we like to think that half of the battle is predicting a negative adverse event before it happens, but then the rest of the battle is actually trying to correct irrational human behavior into rational cohesive actions. So at Philips uh, Connected Sensing, we envision a future where patients are recovering faster. Uh, they are seamlessly transitioning across the healthcare continuum. Uh, we want to develop wearable solutions that disappear into patients' lives. And we envision a future that is uh, patient-centric, where healthcare goes to the patients. Uh, we aspire to build this future through innovative, uh, IoT technologies, design thinking principles, and uh, a very nimble, adaptive, uh, lean startup mindset. 
So to tell you more about uh, how we are tackling some of the biggest challenges, I would like to invite uh, Ravi Kupuraj, who is the business leader for Connected Sensing. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome again to the grand finale, our wearables in Connected Care Challenge. It, geez, it does seem just like yesterday where, you know, this was a germ of an idea. We're just sitting around a table and see what can we do to kind of really, first of all, get some awareness of what we're trying to do in terms of wearables, connected care, et cetera. And big, big kudos to, to Jaydev, Katie Consalvo, the Philips team, and the Metro team for really pulling this off. I want to give them all a big hand. So wearables and uh, connected care, right, Cr and chronic care. Well, uh, who here does not have a wearable on them today? Well, you are definitely in the minority. You know, I, for one, have my activity sensor. I just ordered my new Philips watch. Um, I use a sleep sensor, which tells me how long I sleep, how well I sleep, or how well I don't sleep. But you know, the real question is, can all of these things make us better, healthier humans, help us manage our chronic care conditions, and really lead better lives? I mean, that's really the question, isn't it? We've all seen the stats around chronic diseases. They're astounding. Just between congestive heart failure and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, about $75 billion are going to be sent spent by the youth, just in the U.S. alone, and just factor in about an additional amount in the rest of the world. You know, that is just a bigger and bigger chunk of the overall healthcare dollar, and something has to change. Now, think about it from a human perspective. It's probably no exaggeration to say that every one of us in the audience today is not more than a degree of separation from someone who has a chronic disease or has to deal with a chronic condition. And four out of five of us will probably have to deal with a chronic disease ourselves. So this is something that is going to really hit home. So this is something that is meaningful for us to address, right? So one of the problems of, of the solutions today, including wearables, is that they solve only very small parts of the problem and not the entire problem. And dealing with a chronic disease today feels more and more like you're in a maze with revolving doors, which some people say is emblematic of our whole fractured healthcare system. Even when you look at very specific segments of healthcare, you can see there are gaps in efficiencies. Let me give you an example. You know, in the general care areas of the hospital today, Hospitals are really struggling with how to handle deterioration of patients in the general wards with chronic diseases, especially the ones with chronic diseases. And, and you know, the general ward is a space where typically you're stepped down, you know, from the ICU or from surgery or something like that. And the general expectation is you get better and you go home and you live a better life than when you got into the hospital. But that is often not the case. It's very inconsistent, and that's a big problem today. Let me give you another example. You know, when one leaves the hospital after an acute case or an acute treatment for a chronic disease, they typically go to a skilled nursing facility or home, and they go from a situation where they're cared for 24-7 by a very well-qualified team to where the care is very sketchy. It's very inconsistent in skilled nursing facilities. Similarly, when they go home, you know, they may have some care or they may be left to fend for themselves. So some huge problems in these transitions of care. Lots of inconsistencies, not having the right tools for engagement, not having the right feedback loop for the patients or their caregivers, etc. So I know the entrepreneurs amongst us, which is all of you, 
all of us here, know we can solve these problems. And we can do that by leveraging wearables, algorithms, analytics, care coordination, telemedicine, and a whole lot of other things. As an entrepreneur who's been looking at this space for quite some time at this point, I know we have the wherewithal to do it. I also know, having tried it before, that I can't do it alone. Not one company can do it alone. Not one person can do it alone. It's going to take, as Jaydev said, a true village to come together to do this. And I think today is a big step in that direction. I think together, we need to think in an entrepreneurial fashion, regardless of where we are. I believe an entrepreneur is not just somebody who has a great idea and who can get on Shark Tank. It's anybody who can think outside the box and solve the problem in a different way. I think if you did that, we can bring about a true renaissance that this healthcare system badly needs. And we can definitely leverage wearables and all of the other tools that I just mentioned to bring to bear that renaissance. So I very much look forward to working with each and every one of you as we kind of you know, chart that journey towards creating a better future for all of us. Because we know chronic disease is gonna affect all of us in one way, shape, or form. So with that, uh, I finally want to thank all the people who made this possible, especially Stacy Ruth and Carla Crivet for their support and advocacy in kind of getting this off the ground. And for, to that, we are all grateful, and we look forward to marching with you forward. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Jeff Greenberg. He is the medical director of the Brigham Innovation Hub, where he and his team help Brigham and Women's Hospital physicians and leaders build innovative solutions to key challenges. Dr. Greenberg. <laughs> Thanks to Jennifer and Jim um, and to the Phillips team. It's a real honor to be here. Um, talking about uh, a couple of topics that are very near and dear to my heart. So I'm with the Brigham Innovation Hub. We work with our physicians and leaders to help uh, take their brilliant ideas and promote them and move them forward towards commercialization. And we also think a lot about what's our strategy with digital health and, and new technologies like wearables. And at the same time, I see patients in primary care and I spend all that time mostly dealing with chronic disease and seeing the problems with how we treat them. Um, so uh, I realize I think I'm one of the last things between, uh, between you and, and the, the competition here, so I just thought I'd say a few words about uh, chronic disease and how wearables um, may play a key role. So why chronic disease? Um, so quite simply because, uh, one, we're dying from them. Um, so I thought this was interesting. This is uh, causes of death in the U.S. in 1900 and then in 2010. And what you can see is the growth in uh, chronic disease and the burden of chronic disease as a cause of death. Uh, by my count, eight out of ten of the causes, the top ten causes of death in the U.S. are chronic disease. Uh, I'm considering suicide to be a chronic disease, which I think it, uh, I think it is. Um, so it causes a lot of mortality. Um, it's extremely common. There's a huge market for it. So if you look at the number of American just adults with at least one chronic disease, and these are pretty major chronic diseases, uh, I list them at the bottom, uh, almost 150 million. Uh, so a huge number of people suffering from at least one chronic disease. Um, and it's expensive. Um, so about half of Americans have what would be considered a chronic disease. They're responsible for about 85% of the costs. And I didn't want to make it too complex, but if you break it down, it's the folks, as you might imagine, with three or four chronic diseases that really uh, a lot of uh, money is spent disproportionately on them. And um, I've added some more numbers to yours here uh, in terms of the billions of dollars spent a year on, on various chronic diseases, um, both on direct medical costs and lost productivity. Um, which sometimes I think gets lost in the discussion. Um, so a huge problem in terms of uh, these are killing us, uh, it's a huge market, uh, they're expensive. And this is a slide that I think many people have probably seen. It's great to have some, uh, some Europeans here to, to sort of uh, uh, round us out. But um, on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, uh, is healthcare spending per capita. And on the y-axis is... Uh, is uh, life expectancy. This is a crude measure, obviously, but it's, you know, we need crude measures to, to compare countries in many cases. 
And, and you can see, um, you know, there's the US literally, you know, if you move the line in, we'd literally be off the chart. Um, and, and I put this up here just, you know, as, as a word to the wise, to the, to the folks competing today, you know, your job is to move that USA circle up, not out. Uh, and if we're not careful, right, these are new technologies that are going to cost more money. And if we're not careful and diligent that we're actually getting outcomes in return, then we're just going to move that circle further out and not up. Uh, so uh, certainly I'm not a judge today, but, but I would certainly be concerned with that uh, and looking at that very carefully. Um, so why wearables? Um, <clears throat> so when I think about uh, in my clinic where healthcare needs to go and, and where chronic disease management needs to go, these are some of the things I think about. Uh, and I think wearables have the potential to help in all of these areas. So if you think about setting goals with patients, right, all too often it's, I'm your physician, you need to stop smoking, you need to control your blood pressure, right? It's what are the goals of the healthcare system? We need to be thinking more about the patient's goals, um, and that's hard to do in the environment we're in. But I think mobile technology, web-based technology, technology that allows us to really interact with patients on a more intimate basis, more consistent basis, can help uh, really getting at the patient goals. How we contact with patients, right? So we're very much an in-person. I think 97% of visits with patients currently are in an office. Um, that needs to change, and, and I think will change. Um, so certainly wearables and web technology promote virtual care. Um, they promote passively collected data, um, as we all know, right? Fitbits and everything else, um, which certainly, if handled properly um, and analyzed properly, can, can, uh, can, can very much help with chronic disease management. I think they can help um, the rules we use, the guidelines we use go from being very static documents that are often old and outdated uh, to more learning systems that are rapidly collecting data, collecting outcomes, and analyzing them. And then they can make the follow-up, which is so important in chronic disease, go from a very manual process uh, to an automated one um, so that we really feel like we understand what's happening with our patients and it doesn't take someone remembering to do something uh, to actually call a patient. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we have a very fancy, expensive EMR in my hospital. I am sending emails to myself predating them so that I remember to follow up with someone. I mean, and this is 2016. So, uh, so certainly there's a lot of uh, room to grow there. Um, so what's the other half of the story? Why is this hard? If this is so obvious, why hasn't it been done? Um, so here's a slide. This is Louisiana. Um, <clears throat> sort of tells the story itself, right? So, so culture, what, what, call this whatever you want, culture, advertising. Um, but there's, there's a lot going against uh, some of the behavior changes that we heard about. Um, economics. Uh, so this, this slide shows the consumer price index for various parts of our, for, for different food items. Um, and what you can see, uh, the red line, what's uh, grown the most in 30 years is fresh fruits and vegetables. All right, they've gotten the most expensive among all these different foods over the past 30 years. Uh, what stayed the, the cheapest is uh, carbonated drinks. So why do people still drink carbonated drinks? Well, I don't know, but this is one reason. And, you know, remember the latest stats I've seen are since, since the 2008 downturn, 110% of income gains have gone to 1%. So the 99% has actually seen their income go down. Uh, in the last decade. Uh, so this is really important, right? Uh, and, and it shows that this isn't just a technology problem, that we're fighting economic trends, cultural trends. We're fighting a lot here, and it's not just, it's not just the lack of technology that's the problem. And I think uh, technology, people with technology solutions just you know, need to certainly think about that and, and how they're going to fight some of these underlying forces. Some other barriers to change. Um, uh, dollars, I always need to mention that. So uh, as, as I mentioned on the slide uh, of comparing different countries, um, need to think about the ROI for whoever you're selling to, whether that's a patient who you're hoping will buy a product, a payer, an insurance company, a provider. Uh, fee for service is not going away just yet. It's not going away fast enough. Um, even with the macro rules, it's still a good chunk of physicians' uh, reimbursement is going to be fee for service. So I really would, you know, it, it's important to get in the minds of a payer or a physician and say, what is driving their reimbursement and how is this going to help um, or not cost them? Um, the technology, um, you can use a lot of words to describe current electronic medical records. I chose the word stale. Uh, they're large. They don't move very quickly. They're not always incentivized to innovate or integrate new technology. And, you know, in, in integration costs can be high and there's a lot of vendors out there. So... I would uh, advise, you know, make sure you really need to be integrated to the EMR. I think a lot of technologies don't and probably shouldn't uh, because it's, it's a barrier, uh, as many people know. 
Uh, workflow. So healthcare is one of the few industries that's seen a decrease in labor productivity, so output per hour of labor over the past several decades. I'm not sure what, I think there's one other industry that has, I'm not sure what it is. But, you know, technology tends to drive productivity. It's not done that in healthcare. So people are overworked, physicians and staff. So, you know, if you say to me, you know, Dr. Greenberg, I'm going to give you, you know, a nightly running total of how your patients are sleeping every night, you know, I don't want that. I don't know how to deal with that. So um, make sure, you know, again, put yourself in the, in the position of the patient and, and the providers and say, how is this going to help uh, and not hurt? How is this actually going to help workflow and not hurt it? And then the last thing I think is probably the most important is making sure we engage all patients. Um, there are, like, like in every sector of the economy, um, there are people who will go out and buy new technology, the early adopters. And they're the people that, you know, you're probably going to be able to control their blood pressure, their asthma, whatever it is. Um, but those are also the people that probably would have been controlled currently with existing technology. Uh, and the people that are hard to control are the people who have all sorts of barriers that I've mentioned to care. They may not speak English. They may work three jobs. They may have four kids. They may be a single mom. Right? They don't have a lot of money. Like, how are you going to engage those people and get them and get their chronic disease controlled? Because, uh, again, if all you're doing is making us spend more money on products that control chronic disease and people who would have been controlled anyway, you're just moving that bubble on the, on the slide with all the countries out, not up. So it's, it's figuring out how to engage the people that are tough to engage. And I think a lot of these technologies can let us do that. Um, if we apply them correctly. And I just threw this in. This is the, something called the digital health, health uh, hype cycle adopted from uh, outside of digital health from technology. But it just sort of shows this diagram of uh, early excitement about technology, uh, followed by sort of a dip as people get disillusioned and realize this is a lot harder than we thought, uh, and, then, and then sort of a rise in a plateau. And this was a couple years ago. Somebody put wearable, wearable tech uh, sort of in the peak of inflated expectations. I think we've come down a bit. And people now realize that this is tricky, and, and hopefully the, the finalists today are going to show us how they figured out how to get past some of these barriers uh, uh, and to move forward. Uh, so that's it. Final thoughts. So I think chronic disease, clearly key drivers of morbidity and mortality and, and inflated cost. Huge market, huge unmet need. Uh, huge potential for wearable devices uh, to improve the care of patients with chronic disease and make us more into, into a more patient-centric system that I know we all want our system to be. Um, significant barriers, uh, and we want to make sure entrepreneurs are aware of those barriers and figure out how to get past them. And, uh, and good luck to the five. And I don't know if I'm taking questions or not. Great, and we are almost there, but before moving on, I want to make a quick announcement. We have some of the best and brightest minds in digital health here tonight. Thank you for being here. We want to make sure you're meeting each other, building relationships, and having a good time. This is going to be fun. For this reason, the bar is open all night, <laughs> even right now. <laughs> there's plenty of food, and there's a live stream of the presentations outside. So we want you to feel free to quietly come in and out of the auditorium as you please. And if you haven't seen them, there's some pretty cool demo tables to check out. And we're going to get started. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and a warm round of applause for our celebrity judges. We have Stacy Ruth, business leader, Phillips Medical Consumables and Sensors. Malik Majmuder, Associate Director, Healthcare Transformation Lab at Mass General Hospital. Sanjeev Bhavani, Director of Cardiology, Mobile Health and Wireless Medicine at the Scripps Clinic and Research Institute. And finally, Ivan Salgo, Associate Chief Medical Officer, Phillips Patient Care and Monitoring Solutions. So you don't have to use the same voice I did, but please introduce yourselves. <laughs> Start with uh, Ivan. 
Uh, good evening, I'm Ivan Salgo, Associate Chief Medical Officer for Patient Care and Monitoring Solutions. I work actually in the innovations group developing new technologies and business opportunities for the future, and the future is a lot closer than you realize, and I'm very excited here tonight to uh, look at the contestants and look at opportunities to help patients with real problems. So my name is Malik Majmudar. I'm a cardiologist at Mass General Hospital, where I'm also the associate director of the Healthcare Transformation Lab, which is a relatively new digital health innovation lab really focused on validation and implementation of technologies to improve the care delivery system. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I hope you like the dance. Um, Stacy Ruth. I'm a business leader with Philips. I uh, was originally responsible for bringing the concept of the wearables venture to life, if you will. It's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. Um, in my traditional day job, I'm responsible for bringing innovations to market. Um, and what I'm going to be looking for tonight, just to give you a little uh, taste of it, is really the equation of cost, quality, and outcomes, um, and how we get these things to market as fast as we possibly can. Hi, everyone. Uh, Sanjeev Bhavnani. I'm a cardiologist at Scripps Clinic and Research Institute in San Diego, California. Uh, thanks for the guys to bring me out here, because it's cold here, and you all need to come to San Diego. Um, I, I'm a clinician, but I'm also a digital health clinical trialist, uh, so design clinical trials around a number of the different technologies that we all know about, but how does it fit into healthcare? What are we learning? How do we learn from the patient's end? How do we learn from the provider's end to reach the three objectives that Stacey had just, um, just outlined? Thank you, judges. So uh, we begin the evening with our first team, and as I introduce them, they'll come down uh, the aisle. And hopefully we'll be dancing. <laughs> For the overdose Repo recovery bracelet, we have Dr. Joseph Insler, Dr. Scott Weiner, John Mustokas, and Ajoy Basu. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to present our project. It's called the Opioid, sorry, the Overdose Recovery Bracelet, or ORB. Um, and this is our novel approach to the opioid epidemic. I'm delighted to present our, our winning team. Hopefully. <laughs> Who's up? <laughs> Joe uh, is a, a psychiatrist that works with veterans and is involved with the Harvard Psychiatry Training Program. Uh, John is an emergency physician uh, from Chicago who has extensive business experience and uh, an MBA from Tulane. Um, Ajoy is a medical device expert who's worked with Covidian. Um, Michael Gilbert can't be here tonight, but he is an uh, opioid harm reduction expert. And I'm Scott Weiner. I work at the Brigham in Emergency Medicine. There should be no doubt in your mind that the opioid problem is an epidemic. If you look at the statistics, you can look that the deaths from opioid pain relievers have increased over threefold in the past several years. And if you look at the numbers of heroin deaths, they've increased almost six-fold. Now, it's easy to look at charts like this, but it's a lot harder to actually think that each one of these numbers is a person. And I can tell you that on multiple occasions, I've had the horrific task of calling parents in the middle of the night to let them know that their child had died from an overdose. And when you think that this happens nearly 30,000 times a year in this country, it's tragic, and we want to help fix this. There is hope. There's an antidote called naloxone. And in the past several years, we've markedly increased our distribution and utilization of naloxone. And you've probably seen products like these, which are geared towards bystanders. There's a nasal spray and even an auto injector for naloxone. But the key problem with these is that they rely on somebody else to recognize that someone is overdosing and administer it to them. It doesn't work when people are using or overdosing by themselves. Um, and uh, so we need to improve on this mechanism. This is our concept. We're not focusing on whether people are going to use or not. We're focusing on patients that are actively using opioids. We want to produce a wearable that will combine two things. One is a physiologic marker, such as respiratory rate or oxygen saturation. And if that drops too low, there's a cognitive test for the person. If they, if they don't pass that, they get an automatic injection of naloxone and a call for help.
So conceptually, our device is similar to a wearable like Fitbit or smartwatch and something like that. And this device will monitor the psychological parameter that is consistent with overdose condition. So when you saw it in the previous graph, when you get into a situation of overdose, the device will automatically administer a life-saving dose of naloxone without any external intervention. So the device has uh, different subsystems. Of course, the naloxone auto-delivery subsystem is the heart of this device. But in addition, it has the pulse oximetry, pulse oximetry measuring uh, unit, of course, the battery, and then the smarts of the device. The smarts of the device also can call for help. And it has the snooze capability that if the user is still active, we will not inject the user with a dose of we are very excited about this device, but we do understand that there are some early questions that we need to answer. One is, is pulse oximetry the best or the most effective parameter that we need to monitor for our overdose situation? We also need to study the use behavior in a little more detail and understand its impact on battery life. Of all the subsystems that were shown, the Deluxe Auto Delivery System is the one that we have to work on the most to get this device uh, out to the market. Opioid addiction is like, is unlike any other addiction in that it, it causes such devastation at such an early age. Those statistics that Dr. Weiner showed you earlier, those are kids. They're someone's kids dying in their 20s and 30s. And our device could have saved them. It could have given them a second chance at life. What more could anyone ask for from a medical device? And it wouldn't be just for active users. When somebody gets sober, when they're recently sober, their tolerance decreases. And that increases their susceptibility to accidental overdose. There's over 100 million people in this country with chronic pain, many of whom are prescribed opiates. And as Dr. Weiner also showed you, the number of deaths due to prescription opiates is about twice that from heroin. Our device would provide a valuable safety net to patients with chronic pain and people who are recently sober. But it would also be very helpful for people who are in, lo who are in long term treatment. As many of you probably know, addiction, opioid addiction, is a chronic disease. And with that comes a chronic risk of relapse and a chronic risk, unfortunately, of accidental overdose. Now, the success of our device hinges on patient acceptance. And our market research and focus groups have shown that, that patients have been looking for something like this. Nobody wants to become addicted to opioids. And our patients certainly don't want to die from an accidental overdose. This device would help solve that problem. There's never been a better time or better need for a device such as this one. While the need for a solution to solve the opiate crisis has never been greater, uh, there also has never been a precedent like today's where the market is accepting solutions. Um, solutions um, produced by several manufacturers in different formulations. Um, there is an intranasal solution, there's an intramuscular solution. Um, the only product that is somewhat smart is the Evzio device. Now you can see that the price is obviously um, very disparate and the Evzio device is the most expensive marketed product. It has the capacity to um, have a short sort of instruction, computerized instructions to the administrator bystander on how to administer the device. Um, however, that's, that's the only smart cap capacity of the device. There's nothing that uh, permits administration of naloxone without a bystander. So we stand alone uh, against the competition in this regard. Pricing has been under scrutiny. Uh, recently, there was actually a, a congressional investigation on the pricing of naloxone um, from the multiple manufacturers. So prices are in flux. Um, the picture that was shown earlier 
on the uh, on the one hand there is a syringe that can be administered intranasal. This is the device that the, the formulation that's carried by the paramedics. It's carried in emergency departments. It can be stored in someone's cabinet um, and administered intranasally. And then the EVSIO device that I referred to earlier is on the right. We estimate that the size of the market is 2 million. Now, this is fairly conservative. So there are 2 million documented opioid overdoses in the U.S. on a yearly basis. Some of these are related to heroin. Some of these are related to chronic uh, opiate prescriptions, but we estimate two million, and this is mainly directed at the the individuals who are at risk the most from illicit use. Um, outpatient sales of naloxone have increased uh, by double digits in the last four years, and we expect that this is going to continue raising um, based on the popularity, payer coverage, and um, the willingness of individuals to have a solution to, to save the lives of their family members and friends. When the Evzio device started selling in 2014, uh, approximately 1,000 units per quarter um, were being sold, and now that number has, has increased significantly. For the first two years, we estimate that if we can market the device aggressively to physicians that are responsible for taking care of uh, illicit drug users such as addiction psychiatrists, addiction physicians, um, we should be able to uh, get the device out there and increase the, increase the knowledge about the device. Following that, once physicians are comfortable with it, once the, the public is comfortable with it, we think that the chronic pain population, again this is a hundred million individuals, will start to um, will start to receive and request the device just because of its capacity to save lives. Now, at $2,500, which is a reasonable estimate of, um, of how much it might cost the end consumer, um, this is just above the price of an FZO device. So we, we think that this is a reasonable price. We don't obviously want to um, take advantage of individuals who are suffering from addictions, but um, the market will bear um, this, this estimated price. Now, in terms of the market share, we, we think that this is a cumulative sort of approach. So once a device is sold to an individual, another device would not be sold to that individual. So after several years of marketing, um, we think that you know, we, we can increase the, um, the acceptance. Our intellectual property uh, is currently protected under a provisional patent which was filed last December, although currently we will need additional funds to uh, submit a, a formal utility patent application. Thank you. We're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, I'm sure all of us have a lot of questions. Uh, I have a few questions, actually, around, can we start with uh, the issue of specificity? As you can imagine, most of you as clinicians, there's a number of other conditions where you may have the vital signs that you were specifically targeting be abnormal, and how do you actually know that the overdose was from that event? And then if you use the naloxone, um, what about the dosing of it, and also repeat dosing? As you know, patients may have a rebound, and they may have a false sense of security where they may need a repeat dosing of naloxone. How many doses can actually fit? And how do you actually, is there an alerting mechanism for safety? So well, one of the most amazing things about naloxone is how perfectly the antidote fits with opioid addiction. You know, you, you don't have that with other conditions. So that we're very excited about. Um, in terms of the, the dosing, you know, it, it's tough to calculate, but recently we've seen with the influx of fentanyl and carfentanil, we've seen naloxone not reverse these overdoses, the, the naloxone kits. And so those manufacturers have actually started to increase the dosing of, of what they've been providing. By injecting it, you actually don't need to have the same level as if you uh, mm -hmm. uh, spray it into the nostril. Uh, but from, from looking at what's happened recently, we're thinking probably 1.2 milligrams uh, for, for a naloxone device. 
your first to your first point. Yeah. Uh, so it will monitor things like oxygen saturation and respiratory rate, right. which if both of those go down, then that usually is indicative of an opioid overdose. And then there will be a cognitive test, like the patient actually has to push a button to make it go away at that point if it's a false alarm. Um, I have two, two questions. R&R, &R, could you tell me about the regulatory pathway for an autonomous self-injector and, and what are your thoughts about how you would approach the FDA? And then maybe you could follow that on with your thoughts about uh, how this would be reimbursed. The most similar device that we, that we can compare this to is probably an insulin pump. A, a device that's worn on the body can, ma can monitor certain physiological parameters and then um, administer a medication. So the insulin pumps that we've researched have required FDA um, category three mm -hmm. with, with pre-market approval. Um, so we, we estimate that that's probably going to be necessary. I'm sorry, your second question? Reimbursement. In terms of reimbursement, we'd probably have to go through a similar pathway um, as insulin, as the insulin pumps. Now, that being said, the market conditions for outpatient retail availability of naloxone uh, have never been better, and payers in many states are starting to accommodate naloxone from retail pharmacies. Now, it's not every state at this point, but we estimate that, you know, as states start to develop more legislation, permissive of retail and naloxone availability, um, the payers will, in the, in the states will respond. I have a question about the closed loop feedback um, to the treating physicians. So have you thought about how you might bring the whole care family together? Um, I, I don't know the, the normal process for someone who ODs, but I would assume they would, after receiving the drug, would need to go to an emergency department or initiate an interaction with clinicians. Can you talk to me about how the loop gets closed? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, so built into the device, it'll have a call for help. So once the device triggers, it will uh, call pre-programmed numbers in there. So the family will be informed. And uh, I guess we discussed the privacy issue. So if the person chooses to have 911 called, that will also take place at the same time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Two-fold question, uh, if, 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 if there's enough time. Uh, one, congratulations on uh, you know, identifying an incredible and enlarging gap in healthcare delivery right now. Uh, and uh, on, that, on that end, where there are large gaps, there's also a lot of challenges with trying to address them. So um, uh, before I get to efficacy and effectiveness of new technologies in an autonomous system, uh, you had mentioned you had done some market research. Um, and that with probably focus groups for your patients. And in, in just a nutshell, would you be able to share a little bit about what that data is? Sure. Uh, so Michael Gilbert, who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, is a harm re reductionist and epidemiologist, and actually came up with this idea um, earlier uh, when he was studying in the School of Public Health. And he, provided, he, he looked at uh, patients in California and Massachusetts and found that they, they were looking for something that provided them autonomy and independence to, to manage their health. They didn't want to be a burden on their families. They didn't want to face victimization, uh, which is often what happens when 911 is called. I can't tell you how many times I've had patients refuse to take a naloxone kit saying that, that they, they were be, would be scared to, to use it, scared of what might happen when somebody wakes up, they might get attacked. So I, I think this, this was something that recognized what patients were asking for. Okay. Um, and uh, assuming that a prototype has sort of been conceptualized, as you had outlined that this would be classified as a, as a class three device, right? Um, insulin pumps work because it's targeted towards something that's physiologic and it's modifiable, right? We're using, we're using surrogates for oxygen saturation and respiration as measures to be able to, and that's where the sensitivity and specificity of this test is exceedingly important. In an autonomous system, right, now you have the measure that you're, the, the marker that you're measuring uh, has to be accurate, your delivery mechanism has to be accurate, and then your outcome for after it's delivered has to be accurate, right? So not only is this a closed loop system in the healthcare model, it's a closed loop system for the patient. Intranasal, um, intranasal naloxone works because it's delivered by a healthcare practitioner. So as you sort of think about it, and I'd be curious to see what your thoughts are along this, this is why, the, along these three aspects, it's very challenging. Have you given any thought to, outside of sensing, 
right? Uh, delivery, and then how are you making sure you you can evaluate the outcome that you're 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 desiring. So in essence, a little bit about how you would design a clinical investigation for your class three device. I think it's a very good question, and I think that once once a prototype can be developed that fits our parameters, we'll need to do proof of concept testing, feasibility testing, and it, it's possible that maybe those markers that we initially identify as surrogates for overdose um, are not as specific. There are, there are other technologies um, such as end tidal CO2 monitoring, which is highly specific for hypoventilation. However, we haven't identified yet how to incorporate something with that degree of specificity. I think in the, in the interim, the call for help is the most important part of this too. Because we know that people can sometimes have treatment failures after naloxone, so it has to be accompanied by that. Sure. So false positive is okay in your field, right? And what you're thinking about, it's the false negative that's right. the problem. Right. You can't have any, right? So home-based AEDs is something you might be able to learn from that bystanders at home are being able to deliver them, or they're trained on them. But as you sort of conceptualize how you would design that, I think these are where a lot of the barriers exist. Thank, thank you very much. We have to move on to the next team. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me welcome our next team, Grace Under. Represented by Teddy Hodges. Since I could walk, I've been an athlete. Name a sport, I played it. I even earned an opportunity to play college baseball. But what I had once dreamed of my entire life ended in Vail, Colorado, when Dr. Stedman told me it was time to stop playing. This is my knee. After its ninth surgery, a biological knee replacement, which means I received a meniscal transplant from an individual who left Earth far too early. I was injured at 14 years old, playing basketball, misdiagnosed. I continued playing on torn cartilage and ligaments for an entire year. I had surgery a year later. My sophomore year included four surgeries. Uh, the journey to start learning how to live with joint pain. Along this process, I've worn many knee braces. Not only are they uncomfortable, they actually impede healing. The other options on the market, they're not strong enough, they're not supportive, and they're questionable in terms of joint support. The number one issue with patients wearing these is non-compliance. When I was in college, I even resorted to using a cane. It's hard to describe what it was like using a cane as a 19-year-old. Our mission started with making knee braces better. My grandma taught me to sew when I was young, and a wonderful seamstress in South Carolina helped us to create a product that did just this. We spent many days at the sewing machine, and the solution was an interface in between somebody's body and a knee brace. Problem was, problem is, patients don't wear the braces because they're uncomfortable, they fall down, and they actually hurt. So we thought, why create something that is one size fits all? Something that's completely limited. Why not make something that's better in every way, custom? dynamic, and modular for every unique body? And why not make something that is literally a platform for innovation that can continue to grow and continue to change? Kind of like Legos and how you can construct them in a million different ways. This is Brace Under, a compression base layer with a toolbox of external attachments that creates a custom experience for every patient, regardless of their anatomy, and regardless of their circumstance. So here's how it works. Patient's height, weight, chooses off-the-shelf size, small, medium, large, etc. 
You wear the compression tights, which deliver therapeutic benefits like increased tissue warmth, increased perfusion, blood flow, help with swelling management, venous return. Then you put the external attachment on, like a reusable tension band, what I'm wearing here. The attachments then transform into 3D printed knee braces, tech-enabled solutions that deliver not only support systems, but rehabilitative options. Along the idea of making things better, we embedded the technology for a specific use case in knees. And when we did this, we realized we can use this data very specifically to not only push the status quo of knee injuries, but joint injuries all together. So literally with one compression garment, there are infinite applications and use cases for every unique circumstance. And this is what makes us unique. There is no other product that is truly custom to the unique anatomy of all the individuals. So you take 10 people, the same size and medium, you line them up, it might be different weight, might be different height, different lengths of their leg, different thicknesses of their leg. And what about their injuries? ACL injuries, meniscus injuries, patellar problems. How do you address all those things with just one product? Modularity, modularity. So the market where we started joint braces, the industry is stagnant, hasn't grown, hasn't changed. The IP is stale. Seems like they're more focused on the materials they're using to make a lightweight solution instead of how can you make people heal better. On the other hand, compression garments are arguably the fastest growing segment within the monstrous sports apparel industry. In addition, as we know and seeing here, wearables are growing very, very quickly and fast. And the question is, how do you use those? Brace under is right in between all these industries and is bridging the gap to connect these solutions. So we can talk about the numbers, the 100 million, 100 million people dealing with some type of musculoskeletal problem. National Institute of Health recently said that one in two American adults are dealing with some type of serious joint issue. For me, I'm thinking more about the 13 and 14 year old kids that are having multiple knee surgeries by the time they're graduating high school. More specifically on the 20 million Americans seeing a doctor because of their knee each year equates to a nearly $200 billion economic burden on the United States alone every year. I have the faith strongly that we can address through a compression base layer and a custom solution every single one of these individuals ailments and help them get better so that they don't need it or manage chronic pain, chronic problems. Somebody once said to me, I have no backing to this information, but if all the individuals who needed some type of joint replacement had them today, Medicare would crash. Our solutions, we have early prototypes for the back, the hip, ankle, shoulder, working on the elbow and the wrist next. Business model to start is direct to consumer. $240 per sale includes the base layer tights with a starter strap kit. We're focused right now on building our relationships with strategic partners, medical institutions for research utilizing SBIR grants, orthopedic surgeons, biomechanists, validating what we're doing, professional athletes, professional trainers, and teams who, by the way, are spending millions and millions of dollars for enhancement of performance, injury prevention, and recovery. We're a class one medical device, 510K exempt, which basically means pay big brother his money and they're happy. Our movement today, I'm proud to say we have three non-provisionals pending. 85 units are in circulation amongst a very eclectic population, ranging from four professional athletes to an 18 year old who's had three knee surgeries himself. This spring, we were accepted into the Startup Health Academy, which is, if you're starting a medical device or medical company, excuse me, rather extraordinary incubator based out of New York City. And they are building a global army of healthcare transformers to change health as we know it. This summer, we were nominated as one of the top 50 most innovative sport tech companies in the world. 
and we had the opportunity to present at Mile High Stadium. Go Broncos! Sorry, I had to, I had to do it. <laughs> yesterday, literally yesterday, we were on the main stage of the Cleveland Clinic Innovation Summit, presenting and opening up for the keynote speakers, including the CEO of Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Cosgrove, and a uh, guy you might have heard of, the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. And today I'm here in front of you, thanks to Medstro, thanks to Phillips. So truth be told, uh, by standing here right now, I feel like I've already won. Uh, to be included in a class of companies like this is pretty remarkable. And sincerely wish all of you guys the best success and hope that your success outruns your dreams. Um, this right here is my great grandfather. He was a Harvard Medical School trained surgeon. And um, <laughs> two years ago, in one of the darkest times of my life, I wrote down in a journal things and goals that I wanted to accomplish. One of those goals was to present at Harvard Medical School. <laughs> so it, it, it does happen. And write them down. Write them down. <laughs> After he finished medical school, he ended up in Detroit, Michigan, where he befriended a, a guy you might have heard of, Henry Ford. Henry Ford asked him to open up the first hospital in Iron Mountain, Michigan to care for the iron ore workers producing the metal for the Ford cars. Some of the innovators that Henry Ford, my great-grandfather, were involved with included Edison, included Kingsford for Kingsford Charcoal, um, and also included Firestone, the Tire King. With $10,000, because this is so personal to me, and because uh, where we're at in the the development of our products. I'd like to use that money to make 65 units and give those products to people less fortunate than us here. People that are 13, 14 years old who need and can't maybe afford a solution like this because I do not want to see somebody go through what I went through with joint injuries. A mentor once said to me, a person who has a strong enough why can live with any how. I think for healthcare to transform, we, the people, have to come together and work together, innovate, challenge the status quo, which means getting uncomfortable and breaking things. Thank you. Now we'll take questions from our judges. That's a, that's a, that was a very powerful story. Um, I was going to say, I'm not, I'm not an athlete. Uh, but I did break my, fracture my ankle last year uh, playing football. And the, yeah, it's, it's, it was painful. Uh, and the, an athlete, but you're playing football. <laughs> backyard football Thanksgiving, so nothing competitive. But counts. the question was, did I hear you say, is this only for the knee joint, or are you also at the ankle, uh, or the other joints as well? And the second question is, have you tried um, looking at studying, you mentioned the healing process in terms of recovery speed, or performance to look at the actual outcomes is actually better than the natural healing process per se. Absolutely. Um, as you probably know better than I, validating something medically is extremely expensive and time consuming. Uh, one of my, that's my biggest focus, validating this scientifically. Uh, we have the SBIR grant infrastructure in place using 3T MRIs. I'd like to track tissue changes and watch that on a soft tissue scale. We have a world leader in ACL injuries on our advisory board who's helped us to find the specific use cases of the products so that we can use it in a clinical and functional setting. Uh, your first question in terms of the other body, number one feedback of the 85 people, oh, this is great, can you make it for my hip and my back? And I say, well, yeah, but my, you know, the people that I'm trying to get invest in this say stay focused because they don't want to hear me talking about other products. So definitely, we have ankle, hip, and back ready to roll. Great, so pulling on the garment thread a little bit more and even understanding that this is con um, direct to consumer, uh, I assume you wanna show medical benefit. You have medical advisors on your board. So what sort of medical key performance indicators are you going after and how will you link those medical performance indicators to reimbursement, even if it's direct to consumer? Um, how can you show your return uh, on investment for the consumer or for the physician? Sure, I would definitely lean on the shoulders of people smarter than me in terms of the orthopods and biomechanics and validating that um, in terms of a specific use case. You injure an ACL, valgus event happens. So an ACL injury is typically a non-contact injury, which means somebody doesn't hit you, you just twist funny. Teddy Bridgewater was dropping back like he does his whole life, 
and it happens. So what we'll do is create a valgus load, which includes a very complex movement of the knee, rotation and adduction, and we'll measure that tension, which is what we're doing with our technology right now, so we can sequence what type of load that joint can take, so we know, hey, if you can take eight newtons of tension, you're ready to go back on the field. So we'll pull you using the strap into this position and then say in a step up, a squat, whatever. Get your alignment right, fix your knee, measure that change. We can also do it without somebody holding the strap, putting you into that load and then watching it visually and any blip in the graph as you saw in the visual picture identifies a valgus load, not only that it happened, but how much it happened, which is why we're gonna challenge the understanding of joint loading. So you mentioned that you would go to like an orthopedist to have them fit you, for lack of a better word, with the specialized, so the stockings would be pretty much for everyone, right? And then you would have a customized piece that goes with it. So a physician is required for the fitting, is that, is that what I'm understanding? No. So is there a digital way that a consumer, especially if you're going to choose to go direct to consumer, what is the way digitally and without another you know, person intervening that they could decide which is best for them, which products, which fit? So our system is created, we've said what, you know, if used wrong, what are the chances of injury? And we've identified the three straps that are, have a very low risk of injury. So launching that, we'll use clear video communication to tell the patient where to put it, how to put it. The other avenue is telemedicine, video approach, giving them access and providing you know, consulting type jobs to physiotherapists for a Skype video to tell them, here's how you can wear this and here's the different use cases. So your knee hurts here, try A, B, and C, and then backing that up with a 10 minute Skype call showing them how to wear it and where to wear it. The more advanced stuff, definitely, that, that's where the development is needed and the partnerships are needed. You've done incredible work to date. You have a prototype in place. You've done a pilot study with 85 patients, I think you mentioned. Uh, so what's, uh, a little bit of the arbitrary question, what's missing from your team going forward, like as you think about the next phase in your company and sort of solutions evolution, what's missing? Honestly? Money. Money. Capital. What's well, the number one killer of small businesses? And it's hard to communicate to non-medical investors, uh, you know, even, even doctors. If you're not an orthopod or biomechanist, I mean, you don't necessarily understand what I'm speaking. And I've, I've got to make this my passion. I really love studying this. So I've got to keep it stupid simple. And, sure. you know, it's, that's the challenge. How about your med you mentioned you have medical advisors who are orthopedic surgeons. I mean, that's another resource base that, uh, that I'm sure you see going forward as perhaps, you know, having a varied healthcare experience in, in your background. Um, is that something that's missing from your team? Orthopods? Health, um, uh, healthcare expertise. Um, that's orthopods, physical therapists, administrators, policymakers, funders. Yeah, so we are, um, I'm, I'm allowed to say this now, we're finalizing our relationship with Dr. Salim Parekh. Um, he's a Duke orthopedic surgeon and he's, he's uh, finishing that. I'm sure will we'll help the movement change quite a bit. Um, Andy Barr, he's a world leader in ACL injury prevention physiotherapist. He was the New York Knicks head trainer for four years. So those are the type of approaches in terms of a medical research institute. Um, that's definitely something, I've, and I'd like multiple of them. I'd like multiple minds because what's happening, as soon as I start putting people on my trail of what we've done to date, and all of a sudden they start saying, well, what if you did this? And I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. And all of a sudden, innovation is just collaboration. It's going, you know, that's, that's my vision. Good for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you. Thank you. Our next team, straight out of Philadelphia, our next team, Dr. Ajay Kohli and Dr. Suruchi Dewulkar presenting Cancer Care Partner. We're coming from Philly, so you know we had to represent Rocky. <laughs> My name is Saruchi DeWolker. And I'm Ajay Kohli. We're coming to you from the radiology department at Hahnemann University in Philadelphia, appropriately during the month of October, which happens to be Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast cancer was once considered to be a terminal illness. 
It transcends race, age, gender, and socioeconomic backgrounds. While therapeutic advancements in the last four decades have drastically improved the survival rate of those with breast cancer, these facts are not well um, known amongst patients in our community. As a result, any suspicious finding creates an unimaginable amount of stress and anxiety within patients. Cancer Care Partner was created to help bridge the gap between physician communication and patient education. It's an encrypted, HIPAA-compliant smartphone interface that presents personalized patient education, results, and treatment options. You have a mass in your breast, and it looks like it's breast cancer. Unfortunately, this is a common message radiologists have to convey to their patients on a day-to-day -day basis. These are not easy words to convey, nor are they easy words to receive. The American College of Radiology tried to combat this issue by standardizing the reporting of mammograms. They call this BIRADS. BIRADS stands for Breast Imaging Reporting and Data Systems. There are seven different well-defined categories which were created to standardize the wording of mammographic reports to help reduce confusion and improve communication amongst radiologists and their referring physicians. The problem that remains is that these BIRADS categories, numbers zero through six, convey very little information to patients about their condition. What does BIRADS zero mean? What does BIRADS four mean? How is the patient supposed to know? These words are just the beginning of a cancer patient's journey. They weigh heavy on the minds of the patients and their families. The psychological impact for the workup of a potential cancer is often as catastrophic as the cancer itself. This psychological impact should not be taken lightly. The information presented at that initial visit or even at the time of biopsy is often overwhelming for patients and it's unfair to expect them to digest the reality of their journey during a single office visit. Imagine that your annual screening mammogram was abnormal and the following was presented to you. When a sus suspicious solid mass like this one is seen, it requires further imaging like an ultrasound or an MRI. This will lead to a biopsy to extract a sample of your breast tissue for histologic evaluation. Pathology proven cancer will require a surgical procedure called a lumpectomy, which removes the suspicious mass from your breast. Depending on the malignancy type, Patients will then undergo radiation therapy with or without chemotherapy. This is both confusing and terrifying information. Our app plans to break this information down into digestible chunks in patient-friendly terms so that patients understand their condition and what to expect in order to maximize their survival. The diagnosis of breast cancer is not accomplished in a single visit. It is a multi-visit and multidisciplinary diagnosis. Radiologists, pathologists, breast surgeons, and radiation oncologists work hand in hand throughout the diagnosis and treatment journey. This is the very stressful and emotional journey cancer patients and their families endure. And to streamline this process, we decided to build Cancer Care Partner, a mobile platform that puts patients first and helps them navigate the complicated, the complicated aspect of care delivery. And to explain to you how Cancer Care Partner works, let's take an example of Debbie. So Debbie is a 65-year-old female who underwent a screening mammogram. And as like Suruchi mentioned, she was found to have a mass within her breast concerning for cancer. Debbie will be plugged into the app and she will be able to see her entire care plan, essentially going all the way from diagnosis, be it radiology, pathology, and down to, down to therapy, be it surgery, chemotherapy, as well as radiation. So when she sees that, she's able to develop a beginning and an end to her therapy. This will be a big part of her life, but this will not be her entire life. She can now have a better understanding of what, she, what is ahead of her, and she can develop realistic outcomes of therapy itself. So as I mentioned before, in addition to giving a bird's eye view, you know, what exactly is the care process, what appointments will Debbie have, she will also get specific understanding of both the diagnostic therapy. So number one, she will get her radiological image and her report. But in addition to that, secondly, she will also get an explanation from the physician that tells her, hey, this is the lesion in your breast, but what does that entail for you down the line? Similarly, for pathology, Debbie will get an annotated image that shows her this is the cancerous tissue, but in addition to that, this is the normal tissue. So this is how your therapy will proceed further. And, in, and it's not only Debbie herself or patients like Debbie that would receive all this information. 
all the other uh, physicians that take care of Debbie would also have access to this information so they can better tailor her care so that she has the best possible outcomes. And speaking of outcomes and speaking of therapy, Debbie will also have an understanding of what treat outcome, treat, treatment outcome she will undergo. So if she's undergoing a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, she will be able to understand what does this procedure entail, both the pre-op and post-op, so that she can better expect you know, uh, therapy outcomes so she, so she can prepare herself. In addition, she will also get complications that may potentially arise from this care delivery process. She will also get the same thing for other care delivery options that she undergoes, be it um, radiation, be it chemotherapy, or anything of that nature. And again, the, and a, a good understanding of common complications will have a better prepare were these, um, were these to arise down the line. So Debbie will have all this information, and Debbie will have it at the comfort in her own home so that she can discuss it with her family and her caregivers. But you know, how does this separate us from an EMR? How does this separate us from any web-based online care delivery platform. And this is because we as clinicians are implementing it. We've seen the psychological trauma that patients receive when they get a, care, when they get a diagnosis of cancer. So we decided to implement a validated concept called the stress thermometer. This has been validated by the National Comprehensive Cancer Care Network. And what it does is it helps the patients identify what exactly are some of their stressors. And if the patients say that, oh, well, my stress level is, is high, is it, it's anywhere greater than from a one to a 10, then a member of our team can reach out to the patient itself and ask them questions. Hey, what's going on? And all of this is HIPAA secure so that we can ensure that patients and physicians can have uh, discussions back and forth. So in this example, Debbie can ask her doctor about, oh, I'm having arm pain, and the doctor can potentially reply back and say, this may actually just be a common complication called lymphedema. So this is Cancer Care Partner, a patient-centric platform that revolutionizes cancer care de delivery. And we're doing this by implementing patient education, by building an accessible platform that's available 24-7, 365 on the patient's own mobile device that's reliable. Patients are getting information straight from their doctors as opposed to an online platform that may or may not be correct. And most importantly, this is individualized. So this is specific to patient's care. Additionally, this is streamlining communication because it's, in, it's a very easy to use, user-friendly op option. And in our experience, patients anywhere from 40 all the way down to 80 have had no trouble in using this app. And in addition, it's also HIPAA compliant. All of our servers have, made, have maintained end-to-end -end encryption and we guarantee that we will continue to be HIPAA compliant down the line. And most importantly, not only is this allowing for easier patient-to-physician communication, communication, it's also allowing for easier physician to physician communication as well, so that patients, so that physicians of all different specialties can communicate about the care of their patient. So Cancer Care Partner is bridging together deeply fragmented cancer care. Additionally, it is building a vertical model of care delivery. So many of our wonderful keynote speakers have, have talked about how broken down and how siloed healthcare is today. So we want to build a vertical model that uses innovation specifically for cancer therapy. Additionally, and finally, we are streamlining cancer care. Because although receiving a diagnosis of cancer is tough, receiving cancer care th therapy doesn't have to be. And that is the mission behind Cancer Care Partner. And that is why we would like your support today. Thank you. Quick question here. How do patients actually find out about your product? Because it sounds like you're, it's obvious where your end user is. It's the patient with the cancer diagnosis. But who's your actual customer and what's the business model? Okay, so it sounds like there were three questions to that. So first of all, patients find out, patients that will actually find out, find out about the app from their clinicians. So they will be plugged into the system. Currently, what we've seen is that, you know, as soon as patients receive a diagnosis of breast cancer, they already have one or two care providers that typically tend to increase to like 10 to 15 care providers. So patients would be recommended this app by the healthcare provider or the healthcare system. And that leads me to our business model. So the, there's sort of two aspects that we're looking at in terms of the business model itself. So first of all, we would hope to, so our goal is to, to develop, deliver this to healthcare institutions as well as hospitals so that we can show them that, look, patients not only have a better understanding of their care 
care process. Studies have shown, multiple studies have shown that this leads to more compliance with their, with their appointments, with their therapies. So this would lead to potential this would lead to potentially significant amounts of cost savings. So that is our customer. And the second, second, second aspect, I guess, down the line is that we would also hope to gather all this da data and then apply natural language processing algorithms and potentially use patient-physician communication to see can we get actionable data and potentially work with you know, biotech and pharmaceutical companies to see you know, if you're, you're delivering chemotherapeutic drugs. But patients are having these side effects that haven't really been seen. So those are two of the aspects that we're considering. I just wanted to add something. I also think that it's very realistic in terms of how the app would be set up because with EMRs in most hospital settings, you, we can auto-populate the results directly into the app. And because BIRADS is so standardized, whatever the BIRAD result is for their mammogram, we would have a set explanation in more patient-friendly terms so that they would be able to understand that from the get-go and there's not you know, a physician sitting there typing in the results for every single patient that's coming in. So far, though, we've financed it all by our own radiology resident <laughs> salaries. Humble beginnings. <laughs> so a question coming after the business model. Clearly, you're creating value for patients in terms of the diagnosis, and uh, the stress thermometer is very interesting. Assuming all those pass, what is your sustainable competitive advantage or your intellectual property? If this takes off, how are you going to keep someone from copying you? That's an excellent question, and we've, so we have, we have thought about this, and our and the way that we're addressing is that we have made, uh, you know, so the reason I said we have a vertical model of delivery is that we are specific towards cancer care. We are looking at all the different aspects of care, all the way from diagnosis to therapy. So we continue to implement innovations that will help patients have better outcomes down the line. So stress thermometer being the first one, and we hope to do several more. Uh, that would potentially make an impact for patients as well. So like any other business, and there's so many great businesses here, ultimately it comes down to innovating and how well can you, you know, show an impact for patients. And we feel with the clinical backgrounds that we have and the, you know, the patient care that we've seen, we hope to continue to do that. And, and as a vertical for cancer care delivery, we're confident that we can. One more thing, sorry. Um, uh, Ajay did a great job. I just wanted to add one more thing. It's just that um, for EMRs, I think that it's very overwhelming for patients to log in and see all this information that they may not necessarily know is related to their diagnosis. Like, is there hemoglobin A1C related to the breast cancer? I know it's high, but how does that impact this? And I think that this app, which is specifically for their breast cancer and their uh, treatment options and their journey throughout it, will help... Um, hone in on what's really important for them so that they're not lost with all the other information that's available on other EMR systems. Thank you, Cancer Care Partner. Thank you. For our next team, representing my spirometer, Ryan Roberts. I'm actually Ryan Riker. My partner, Ryan Roberts, is uh, not with us today. Um, he's, uh, well, he's, he's not with us at the event today. <laughs> so. yeah. can, can you elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, actually, he's in uh, San Francisco. He's uh, just started a new job at Google. And uh, the two of us were down in San Diego, which is uh, where this, this whole concept started. So, um, so again, uh, this is our team here. Ryan's on the top there. This is initially his idea. Uh, this all spurred actually from uh, a, a mix of a couple different things. First was his past experience. He built an anemometer, which is uh, just a basic wind measurement device, uh, which is mechanically driven. So it had an impeller in it. And he built uh, that business up and sold it. And then shortly after, he actually had his aunt pass away from COPD, which spurred the idea for him to start looking into the industry for spirometers and seeing how did this happen, you know, why wasn't there something able to catch. Uh, and monitor and manage her disease. So the gentleman on the bottom, uh, Mr. Eschenbacher, is basically one of the top two authorities in this space. So John Hankinson and Bill Eschenbacher together had written the standards for the use of spirometry. So the ATS, the American Thoracic Society, uses his standards for devices like this in measuring for you know, lung capacity and monitoring patients with asthma and COPD. 
Uh, Bill, we went to and just initially were asking him for some feedback, wanted to see what he thought about the project. Next thing we know, you know, he's fully on board. He's put his own capital into the project as well, and he is part of our base team. So the three of us together uh, have great experience in all different categories to kind of come together and be able to make devices, bring them to market, and, uh, and sell them. And, I, and I've got a pretty uh, extensive background in online marketing. I sell chemicals that are used for pharmaceutical research. I've built the largest uh, free search engine that exists online with over 15 million products uh, for pharma and biopharma research. So that's my background as well. And uh, let's get into the device a little bit. So the category is huge. A couple of great graphs that were brought up here initially. Uh, you know, from the 1900s, it was tuberculosis, which isn't as big of an issue or a cause these days, but still in the category of COPD. And that was number two. Now it's number three. So COPD and asthma together, these are, these are basically low figures in, the, uh, in those categories as it is. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease for COPD. It is the third leading cause of death. I'm glad when that graph came up that my, my uh, numbers matched up and it wasn't fourth or something. But it's a huge category. And in most countries, it's either three or in the top five if it's, if it's behind that. So when we talk about that, uh, the other great thing that came up was that graph. How do we affect that graph? We have to go after huge markets. So this is an enormous market, third largest killer in the US. Why isn't something being done about it? Why hasn't there been any innovation in this space? When Ryan came to me with this concept, you know, just like everybody's got great ideas all the time. I've, I've had a million that I've, that I've scrubbed. I've got a book that's by my bed, you know, once a week or so. I write down a new idea that, you know, usually I start looking online and realize, okay, maybe it's not that good. This is a fantastic idea because it's a huge category and it's an extremely you know, stagnant market. All the devices that are out there right now are not able to do what we've created in our, in our device. Uh, the main study that we got feedback on was 85% of the people in the study for home spirometry said they don't have a device because of the cost. The average price of these devices is right around $1,600. Nobody's going to pay for that out of pocket. Nobody's going to be able to go to the store and pick up a device like this for $1,600. And this is for the masses. So if they're going to have to pay for it out of pocket, it has to be cheaper. The second part is precision. All these devices out there on the market right now, not only are they expensive, but they're mechanically driven as well. Much like Ryan's anemometer, they use a mechanical measurement technology, which has lots of imperfections and is nowhere near as precise as what we've created. Uh, data tracking. So these other devices that are out there, not only are they lacking these other issues, but somebody goes and uses the device, say they even get a, a somewhat accurate reading, now what do they do with it? There's nothing to do with the information that they just had. What are they going to do? Build their own spreadsheet, monitor it themselves, build their own algorithms or to try to figure out if there's something actually wrong with them or not. What they want to do is know if they're trending downwards in their lung capacity so that they can catch the issues that result in all of these deaths in the category. Um, the procedures that along with those devices don't guide them through the process. They're going to be a lot harder to use because, again, they're not showing you step by step what to do, and they're also not giving you proper feedback. They're large. Uh, pulse oximeters has come up here several times now in these conversations. Pulse oximeters used to be the size of a VCR. Now they're worn on the tip of your finger. They're twenty dollars, and you know they've got great feedback that a lot of people use and, and need on a regular basis. Uh, this is the device that's going to be the new version of that because right now there is nothing in the category that's been sized down and with all these different you know, capacities of technology and pricing. So here's a good couple of examples of what we have out there right now. Um, the NDD, 1500 bucks. Uh, the Mir, over 2000 uh, The Mir has a couple models um, well over that price. This is kind of one of their moderate price ones in the three. They've got three and $4,000 devices. The Vitalograph and the STI. You'll notice a common thread on all of these devices. The fact is the cylindrical entry point on all of these devices. What that entails is a turbine on the inside. When you take this test, you're initially exhaling at a high rate of volume. So it's a six second test is what you're aiming for. You breathe out really hard on the beginning. What happens when you breathe out really hard initially? That, that impeller starts to spin really fast. On the tail end of that test, if any of you can actually breathe out for six seconds straight, it's pretty difficult. On the tail end, there's almost no air practically coming out of your lungs. But it has to be measured in this test for it to be accurate. You can't do that with this type of technology and the precision that we've got in ours. And what we've done is we've created my spirometer. This is real, people. This is an actual device. This is our, one of our final prototypes. 
We've got great packaging together as well already for it too. And we've completely redesigned the concept. You can also, if I could go back on this actually, you can see on these other devices, these are, these are uh, LCD screens that, again, are not giving you any real feedback while you're using it, not giving you any information that you need. Ours is a simple sync up with a press of a button. It uses a completely, completely different measurement technology. As you can see, it's not cylindrical, so it wouldn't be able to use an impeller. We're using a sensor that automatically calibrates upon powering up. What that does as well is that the other devices can't do is it's going to measure temperature, humidity, altitude, and a number of other factors that without those readings into your test, it's not going to be an accurate test either. This is drastic, drastic change from the devices that are on the market right now. So the app will then sync up. You'll show the device hooking up in one of the first screens. You'll put in as well, we, this is kind of an abbreviation of what we have. You'll put in all your stats, your age, your sex, your race, because all of those are going to be factored into the test as well. You go through the test, you hit start. It's going to have a graph. We'll have some gamification built in there for the youth as well, because on the pediatric side, we see a huge market for this. People will take care of themselves okay. I've got a seven-year-old. I guarantee you I'll take care of him way before I take care of myself with any devices or activities like this that could, that could help him. So we're definitely aiming for the youth market. The device can be used from ages five and up uh, for what we're aiming for. Uh, Bill has built in some parameters to catch any inaccuracies in the test. If you're coughing, if you don't do it long enough, if the initial exhalation is, you know, is done improperly and, the, and it, anything is off from your initial baseline test to show that you're not, you haven't done the test right, you won't get that good sign. You'll, say, you'll get a sign that'll say to retake the test again. That's live as well in our app right now that we've already developed. Uh, the IHI Triple Aim of Health is, you know, it, it's great. I love what Philips has done here. This is the future. IoT, Bluetooth connected devices, is the future of telehealth monitoring patients. You can't do it without devices like this. You can't do it in categories that are actually going to move the needle on that graph without a product that's going to hit enough people in a large category. A spirometer is one that will. There's your, there's your triangle. Uh, population health, per capita cost, experience of care. How are, we going to, how are we going to attack these things? Improving their experience. Right now, they don't have anything to really link themselves back to their doctors. They don't have any way to connect back to their practitioner to give them the feedback and the results of their actual lung volume on that day, on a daily basis. It's going to keep an eye on trends, which is going to keep them out of the hospital. There's studies showing right now that devices like this have a minimum of around 85% rate of keeping patients out of the hospital. You talk about, he said, see, see if we can move this number up. He was, you know, moving that number up was to get the age, the age like life expectancy up. We're going to move it up and we're going to move it way in because this is now not only a cheap device that's going to save people's lives, but it's also going to be able to do it in a way that's going to make you know, an easy process for the patients to connect back with their practitioners. Um, the expenses related with this right now, these devices, again, really expensive, $1,600. $1, We're going to be at a fraction of the cost of that. We're developing this device uh, extremely inexpensively. Um, even with all the technology that's built into it. Ryan and I both have a lot of experience with, you know, doing things like this and we've got connections and we've already gotten to this point with a low amount of capital. Um, oh, that's the end of that one. All right. Um, improving the health of populations. This is, you know, also part of the triple aim. Uh, so huge category, again, 350 million. That's growing. The growth on that is projected. Uh, to, you know, Ryan, 15 to 20. Ooh. Sorry, my apologies. The, oh, I uh, blew it. <laughs> uh, uh, we have to keep it to 10 minutes in Shark Tank style. So okay. All right. We'll turn it over to the uh, judges for questions. Uh, two questions. Uh, what are you measuring besides FEV1? And tell us about your sustainable competitive advantage or intellectual property. Okay, yeah. So we've got, there's, there's about three or four main readings that people are going to want to see on the test. You could, some people have it marketed out with, you know, 10, 12 tests that you could show with that. But you want to focus down to FEV1, FVC, it's uh, FVC over FEV1. So there's a couple, there's three or four main ones that Bill's going to choose that we're going to do. And, um, but we don't, wanna, we don't wanna give them more information than somebody themselves could already use. They'll be able to read their, their feedback and their practitioner will also have a platform where they can see all the feedback daily and monitor all their patients at once. So it's connecting the care team all together like that. And tell me about your IP. 
So we've already fi uh, filed a patent on this. There is no device on the market and there's no patents in place, believe it or not, that we're ever trying to patent the use of a sensor like we've done and we already have a patent filed as of, you know, last spring. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you, you've talked a little bit about uh, population health and I could see uh, an application in population health for this. Um, but in order to be effective at population health, you have to first narrow in very quickly on the population you're going to serve. And you started with two, so I'd like to know which one um, you're starting with. Um, and then the second question would be around uh, the data or analytics and how that might be used to improve outcomes overall for population. So first the category and then... Um, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to, you know, pick one or the other. We can easily attack both at the same time. Everybody that are in these categories know that they, they have a problem and they're going to need this device. So we're going to, we're going to market it to COPD as well as asthma, you know, simultaneously. We're not going to do that in stages. Um, as far as, can you elaborate on the second question? Yeah, so it's really around the analytics. So um, what will drive the outcome changes is to be very smart about the analytics. And I'd like to understand how those are going to be integrated into larger platforms. Um, so that when programs are established in population health, you're one piece of that program. Right. So yeah, people that are using these on their own without their practitioner connected, they're buying it directly. They're going to have feedback from the device and the app that's going to say, okay, you're trended off your baseline to amount to where you either need to check into your practitioner or go directly to the ER before you have a fatality, essentially. The second part will be the practitioner's platform. So we're going to have practitioners take this on as our goal. Uh, there's a CPT code for reading these tests already that exist, mm -hmm. so it's easy to get it covered. We can even give the devices away for free in those scenarios. Somebody signs up for a year, the practitioner gets reimbursed for reading the tests. We take a little cut as well, and, um, and it's a, it's, it's a, it connects telehealth in, in this space where it hasn't existed before. The, the pulmonologists that we've reached out to already are, are dying to get it into their practice. So along, along that line, um, how, where is your distribution? Is this how, do you see it as a mechanism for patients to have access to first, or is this a practitioner, quote unquote, prescribed device? Uh, we've got, uh, there's about five sales channels that we're going to approach with doing this. Initially, we'll start with direct to consumer. It's the easiest way to get it out there and get, get traction with it. Um, one, of the, one of the categories will be to have practitioners taking it on almost as a wholesaler themselves. There's a number of distribution channels as well that sell these types of devices or reach out to them they want new products in their line. All the things that you can see on the market are extremely dated. So they want, they want new devices in their line that they can go out and pitch and have something new that can also, they can sell to more people before that couldn't afford what they're selling right now. One more question. One, one last question. Great. Uh, go back to the competitive advantage. You know, there are two companies that have FDA cleared mm -hmm. smartphones parameters, Cohero and Spiral Labs. Right. So how do you compare to? Uh, this is the only one with a barometric pressure sensor. So again, their devices are not using a sensor that can actually read out all the other data that's in the space. You take this device and you use it in Colorado at 6,000 feet, and you go and use a device at sea level, you're going to get a precise reading. You're not going to get that with other devices that don't automatically calibrate in the setting that it's being used at. And it's more precise with its test, too. It's just, it's, the readings are just going to be more precise. 96% of the devices on the market are not passing the proper ATS standards. We're already, we're already past those points with the device that we have right now. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Now, for our final presentation, please welcome Arsh Vatsangam presenting Mobile Analytics. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around for two, this long. I know I'm the one, only one standing between you and the bar, so uh, I promise it'll be worth your while. Um, at Moving Analytics, we help hospitals deliver home-based rehab programs for cardiac patients. Let me tell you about the problem that we solve. This is Joe. He just had a heart attack. And after his heart attack, he was given cardiac rehab to improve his cardiovascular fitness. If Joe does cardiac rehab, he doubles his chance of living another five years and cuts his risk of readmission by a third. But there's a problem. There are four and a half million patients like Joe in the U.S. every year and less than 20% of them enroll for their first rehab class. And the reason is, to participate in rehab, Joe would have to visit a hospital 36 times over three months and spend $1,800 out of pocket as copay. 
Despite such evidence, Joe does not go. This is obviously bad for Joe, but for the hospital too. Because starting next year, with the coming of bundle payments for cardiac care, hospitals will be on the hook for up to $2 billion in readmission costs because their patients don't do rehab. So hospitals are really looking for ways to increase access to rehab, but are limited by the current delivery model, which requires patients to come to the center and requires a lot of staff. So that's where we come in. We at Moving Analytics help hospitals implement technology-enabled cardiac rehab programs that their patients can do in the comfort of their homes. We're based on a program called MultiFit, a home-based care management program built at Stanford University. Over 20 years of research, multiple randomized clinical trials, and validation on over 70,000 patients, this program was shown to have the same clinical outcomes as center-based rehab and a 40% readmission reduction rate. It also has a 90% completion rate, which is 9 out of 10 patients to start the program completed. What we've done is we've taken this program and we've digitized it in a care management system for nurses and a mobile app that patients can use to receive rehab in the comfort of their homes. Further, we've hired the team that built MultiFit and through them provide implementation guidance and expertise to seamlessly integrate this program into a hospital's workflow with minimal effort, maximum impact. Let me take you through how it works. When a patient is discharged, like Joe, he's given a customized treatment plan. This plan is created on the nurse's dashboard and then downloaded onto his smartphone or tablet. At home, the app guides you to ready rehab goals, like doing, their ex doing his exercise, tracking medications, tracking vital signs, and so on, and reports his progress back to his nurse. It also analyzes Joe's information to see if there's anything that, needs, that the nurse needs to worry about, and then conveys that for immediate action. Once a week, Joe receives a phone call. And as part of this phone call, his nurse, his nurse coaches him and identifies any key issues and modifies his plan as necessary. This goes on for 12 weeks. For this service, we charge $300 per patient episode. And at 4.5 million patients a year, that's a $1.3 billion market opportunity. Our first point of attack is to reach those hospitals that are in bundle payment models starting next year. That's a $75 million market. And our value proposition is straightforward. We help a hospital scalably deliver quality, evidence-based programs that their patients can do from the comfort of their home. In addition, because they're able to serve hundreds, if not thousands of patients with little or no staff overhead, they can save up to $3 million in readmission costs per site. And this value proposition has really resonated with our clients. Since launching last year, we are now in 10 hospitals, including the Keck School of Medicine, NYU Langone, two VA sites, Trinity Health, and many more. Through our rollouts, we've shown that patients using the solution have improved their functional capacity by 50%, a key metric for prevent, pre predicting long-term readmissions. 50% of patients who have offered the solution have adopted it, and it has an 80% completion rate and zero readmission so far. This thing actually works. And this is possible because of our amazing team. I have a background in chronic disease management. I, I got my PhD in computer science writing software for chronic disease management. Our clinical team has over 60 man years of experience between them in delivering and creating home-based rehab programs for their work at Stanford. And our operational executive team has built over 20 world-class products as part of multiple companies and have delivered home-based rehab programs in over 20 hospitals. This team has actually won an award from the American Heart Association for being one of the most innovative companies in heart health. Yeah, there's a lot more that I could say, but I'd like to end with this thought. Take a patient like Joe. If he does cardiac rehab, he doubles his chance of living another five years. And I'd like you to think to yourselves and your loved ones, what is five years worth to you? The birthdays, the anniversaries, the time spent with your, the vacations, the happiness, the joys. The shocking fact is that 80% of patients after a heart attack or heart surgery don't get that because of stupid issues like cost and transportation. To me, that's a crime. Our mission as a company is to change that. I would love it if you could join us in that mission. If you or you know anyone who would like to work with us, we'd love to make this a reality because I think this is a problem that needs to be solved and we have the means to solve it today. Thank you and have a great evening. Judges, questions? Yeah. It's, it's
think you picked a really good problem statement, a problem area. I think it's uh, a little bit embarrassing as cardiologists uh, that the referral rate for cardiac rehab is 14 to 18 percent over the years. But one of the, one of the issues, one of the reasons that is, is that cardiac rehab centers traditionally has been actually cost centers for the hospitals because the reimbursements are in the order of 80 to 120 dollars or so, very very low reimbursement rates. Uh, however, just two three months ago, I don't know if you know this, there's a new billing code for cardiac rehab that seems is approved that's going to pay up to $1,800 to $2,600 right. for cardiac rehab because I think the government recognizes the benefits of cardiac rehab. Yep. So how do you manage the competition now where health systems, I think, talking to a lot of cardiologists around yep. the country, are actually interested in setting up centers for cardiac rehab versus your model? So how do you manage that? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there's something like an incentive payment for yep. uh, cardiac rehab programs. That's right. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think that is also a test that they're running to see if it actually does improve cardiac rehab participation rates. Uh, but I also think that even if you do that, um, there's still going to be a large percentage of people who are going to live two hours away from yep. a cardiac exactly. rehab site right. or who have to navigate through LA traffic where I'm from, you know, so, and so that's going to be a huge deterrent for them to participate. Okay. So I don't think the right answer is center-based or home-based, but rather a hybrid of those two approaches. And again, goes back to the question, like, what's good for the patient? What do they want? Uh, do they want to recover from home? Is it safe for them to recover from home? Uh, and so let's design a program that matches their needs, right? So if it is center-based, so be it. If it is home-based, we should offer that. And I think home-based solutions like ours complement center-based solutions in that center-based solutions are community-based, rely on social dynamics to, uh, to kind of uh, motivate patients. As home-based approaches basically personalize care. You, you get a deep insight into what the patient's doing at home. You know what symptoms they're facing, what issues they have, and that you can use that to further improve their care. So I don't really view it as competition, but an augmentation of the program. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Right. Yep. I see this is very impactful, so I, I'm very impressed with what you've done. Um, my question would be in the ecosystem and how to scale more quickly um, how would you use a company like Philips? How would you use um, companies large and small yeah. to help you scale more quickly? Yeah, so I think our, our vision for this is, you know, we need to deliver the best, most convenient program for these patients after they have a heart attack or heart surgery. Uh, to that end, you know, we're looking for partners who can basically, uh, so who are already in a medical system, for example. A company would be like Philips, basically. And what they would do is essentially provide our solution as quote unquote an app to basically, as part of their suite of solutions, it would connect to the EMR, it would connect to everything else that the uh, doctors and nurses are using, and it would just be immediately usable. Uh, it would also uh, interface with a lot of the devices that Philips makes, you know, case in point, the recent uh, whole kit that Philips came up with. And by the way, if, if you think we can work with, I'd love to start that process as well. <laughs> so, um, so uh, you know, especially, you know, the medical grade devices that Philips is putting out, right? So. Uh, we want, you know, you, your coaching is only as good as your data. Um, so uh, basically what we'd like to be able to do is to promote the broader suite of services that if a patient's willing to wear it, uh, will basically give us better data, better coaching, and better outcomes for patients. Um, and our, similar note, you know, we'd like to address other issues like trans if transportation is true, we'd like to partner with Uber or Lyft or anything like that to basically make it easy for the patient to go to and from the hospital. So, uh, yeah, th those are the ways I see us really offering everything the patient needs to recover faster and better. Great, thank you. Um, can I ask can one, I, oh, one, one, one last question? Quick, okay. quick, sure. quick, quick question. Uh, sustainable competitive advantage. Uh, how do you prevent someone from copying you? Yeah, so uh, I completely agree that anyone with three months of time can write code, write software, and get it done. Um, I think our short-term competitive advantage right now is the fact that we have an evidence-based protocol that's been validated and tested, which any kind of validation, no matter how much time you put to work with hospitals, takes time. In the long term, I really see us enhancing this solution with data. So as we collect data across hundreds, thousands, millions of patients, we can actually go from being just a reactive system to a proactive system and basically giving a hospital a thermometer of their patient population and saying, hey, these are the 10 patients out of the 1,000 you should be looking for because next week, most likely, they're going to come back to the hospital. 
Uh, and that is something that I think we, we are trying to push on. It's not just a coach for the patients. We want it to be a coach for the nurses and doctors as well. Because one of the last things the doctor wants is an additional 100 data points that they want to see. They want to know, what do I need to do? Can you help me remember uh, what I need to do? What is the assistance that I need? So that's where we're trying to push our product. Up, and we can do that because we're focused on this one thing and we can do it really well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh. Thank you to these five fantastic presentations. Judges, please take a moment, and I mean a very quick moment, <laughs> now to finalize your score sheets and make any last minute changes. Jim and Abby will be over to collect them in a minute. While they're doing that, we're going to have some brief closing remarks from Carla Krivet, CEO of Philips Patient Care and Monitoring Solutions. Thank you, great to be here in a room full of intellectual um, spirit, in, in full of entrepreneurship. Um, I very much like what we heard early on, it takes a village to really create something. Uh, it takes a community, certainly a research hub within a large corporate organization is not enough. We need to co-create. We have to team up with our customers, and we love doing that. And more and more, we are teaming up with young startup companies. So I'm so excited to be here and see this opportunity. If I think about a year and a half back, um, we had a discussion about connected sensing and what we do in that area within Philips. And Philips, market leader in patient monitoring, we are in every second hospital. Uh, great innovation prices, and we had quite some discussions how and if and how we should embrace this new technology and how and if at all we should support it, because obviously there are people in the room afraid of cannibalization. I was one of the proponents really going for it, because I said, hey, we are the market leaders, we are the ones who need to be the cannibalizers in our own company. We have to be at the forefront. We have to make sure we get the best minds together in a very innovative environment. So a year and a half later, I'm standing here. I'm really proud what Ravi and the entire team created. So big applause to the Connected Sensing team because... <laughs> you guys are not just really great in developing the new solutions, testing it with customers, making it better. But also, I see this as a kickstar, a kickoff of creating an ecosystem we heard so much about. So it's great to be here. Also, for one other reason, we are in Boston. And Boston is the home of Philips for many, many years. Boston area, we recently invested in a research center in Cambridge, um, large corporation with MIT and more and more startup cooperation. So I'm so excited to meet many of you um, at the beginning of this meeting and also afterwards, still hope to have the opportunity. And right now, I'm happy for the third time, and that's because I'm not one of the judges, because I wouldn't know which one to choose. <laughs> Great ideas, really inspiring, and we have the competition today, but I hope we find opportunities beyond that competition to collaborate. Um, we have connected sensing, but we have lots of other businesses in radiology and patient monitoring and AEDs. So I heard throughout the um, presentation many connecting points. So please come up after this discussion and see what we can do together. And I really hope, Ravi, this is not just one um, challenge, but the first of many, many challenges and of a joint journey for all of us. Thank you very much. And now, looking forward, looking towards the judges. Thank Great, you. thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite the Philips Connected Sensing Venture team and judges onto the stage because we're going to give out some awards. Given the time restrictions, we were only able to have five finalist teams. Um, but with that said, there are two teams that we feel should be recognized with honorable mention, either because of their social mission or because of their novel approach. So this time we're gonna take a moment and do that. 
Dr. Lisa Gultieri with Recycled Health, a program that collects wearable activity trackers for underserved populations. <laughs> Dr. Gultieri. And second, David Cabot and Meg Wood with Biotome that makes a wearable magnetic resonance hydration tracker. Now before the big reveal, I just wanted to let you know that there will be full coffee and tea service and array of desserts. So please feel free to stay, linger, and eat some more after the winners are announced. We are going to announce each winner and hand out the prizes. We ask that all finalists and winners stay close for photos immediately after. And that means Jim and Abby, you guys have finished tallying. Uh, we can get the checks. <laughs> yes. Yes, fantastic. Okay. You are announcing the I am? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, we've just come back from our cloister and uh, <coughs> The, uh, <laughs> we've essentially uh, added up all the, the, the judges' um, uh, scores. They scored on uh, several different criteria. Um, and we'll begin with the third place winner, okay. which is Cancer Care Partner. Thank you. <laughs> Next in second place, winning the $5,000 award is my spirometer. And finally, whoops, <laughs> I should have done this earlier. <laughs> The uh, announcement you've all been waiting for, our grand prize winner, uh, accompanied by music, I think. All right. The $10,000 grand prize goes to Moving Analytics.
Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Phillips, for sponsoring. We have coffee and desserts out back. Please feel free to mingle uh, until 9, 9.15, however. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>